My name is Kevin Hamilton. I'm the president and CEO of New Energen. We're located in White Plains, New York, and happy to be here. So what we're going to talk about here in the next minutes is how large organizations, principally government entities or large private sector entities, can implement demand response programs across multi-site, multi-agency organizations. And we're going to talk about one case study, which is a client of New Energen, the city of New York, uh, who is really unparalleled, unrivaled today, and that's not an exaggeration, uh, in terms of implementing demand response across multiple agencies. And we'll go through with you how they did it. It's a real success story, and they've been recognized a lot over the last couple of years as a result. My organization will not take credit for it. We, we've had the good fortune of working with them on, on this initiative. Um, we, uh, but we've learned a lot from it, and, and that's what I'm here to discuss with you. So as I say, uh, this is about um, uh, implementing demand response programs across complex government agencies. And, and uh, the, 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 the core message here, and my organization and others do lots of business with the federal government, with the United States Navy, with the United States Army, with other large municipal organizations separate from the city of New York. And oftentimes, in the very early stages of the conversations between someone like myself and the decision makers on the other side, is uh, fear. <laughs> They, uh, they have these dictates, whether, they come, whether they're uh, sustainable dictates, uh, renewable energy objectives that come down from governors. If you're talking about the federal government that comes from the President of the United States, they have all of these goals which are laudable. And you have these energy managers who think to themselves, how in God's name am I going to get people's attention? How am I going to implement across 300 sites on the East Coast? And, uh, and, and that kind of um, paralyzes them, if you will, in terms of taking the first step. And so I'm going to talk to you about um, how we convinced the city of New York and what we learned from that. And uh, the bottom line is, um, is uh, you can do it. Uh, it's easier to introduce uh, to agencies once you begin with one. It's easier to introduce to agencies who have not been participating. Uh, it's important to engage individuals in these organizations. We say from boots to suits. You know, people who work in the power plants, people who work in facilities engineering, facilities management, lots of the folks that you often interact with, on up to senior level decision makers. And once they understand what this is all about, they jump in, and they jump in in a big way. As I said, New Energen um, is a demand response provider as an organization. Very briefly, we also source electricity and natural gas for our clients, putting hedging strategies in place for them as an independent consultant. We also audit uh, utility bills. Uh, our larger clients just in the New York area include the Metropolitan Transit Authority. The subway system in New York City is enrolled in demand response, which is an interesting story. The airports, the bridges, the tunnels, the New York and New Jersey Port Authority, the United States General Services Administration, the Navy, and folks uh, like that. Um, let's move ahead. Uh, I should not presume that all of you know what demand response is. So very briefly, in layman's terms, what demand response is, is a power grid reliability program. It's an insurance policy that the utility companies and that the electric independent system operators across the United States rely upon to prevent a brownout or blackout. And really, it's only for about 12 to 16 hours of the year. For about 12 to 16 hours of the year in the population centers of the United States, whether it's the Washington to New York corridor, or out on the West Coast, or in, or in Texas, um, the power grid is at risk of failure, brownouts and blackouts. And the reason why it's at risk of failure is because the demand on the electric power grid is close to the supply. It's getting close to. Usually the threshold is about 92, 93, 94% of peak capacity is when the utility companies uh, and the independent system operators, the ISOs, get really nervous. And what they do is they contact folks like New Energen, other demand response aggregators, and they say, help me out. Ask your clients to curtail load. And, uh, and so for about, as I say, 12 to 18 hours of the year, they really rely upon us very heavily. And when a demand response event is called, normally they're about, it varies around the country, but a good rule of thumb is it's about a four hour event. Normally, it's from about 2 to 6 in the afternoon, as you might expect, when peak demand for electricity occurs. 
oftentimes it's on that third 95 plus degree day in July or August. And uh, when you have all of those heavy air conditioning loads uh, coming into play. And, um, and so what happens is uh, our clients are asked to curtail. And this is what you're seeing here is a, uh, oh, I have a pointer. I'm just realizing that. What you're seeing here is a normal load distribution for any typical building. And, and we're talking about office buildings, office towers, universities, hospitals, wastewater treatment plants, you know, so large commercial institutional um, facilities in our case, in this case. In some parts of the United States, there is such a thing as residential de demand response. We're on a residential level. The utility company controls one's thermostat and can, and can turn, change sets, set points on the air conditioning system. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about something that's much larger in scale, large commercial and industrial facilities. And so that's a typical load distribution on a day. What happens is the demand, usually again around 2 o'clock or so in the afternoon, is such that the utility company has said, and normally it happens earlier in the day, they have said to, to folks like ours, um, from 2 to 5, 2 to 6 this afternoon, curtail. And so what happens is the client curtails their electrical load. They get below what's called the target load. And, uh, and then at the end of the demand response event, they go back to normal operations, and so on and so forth. This is a 24-hour uh, load distribution. So what are some common strategies for demand response? Even though most facilities are unique, there really are just a handful of strategies. First and foremost, you look at the base building HVAC systems, those sources of demand for electricity. So it's chiller plants, fan systems on HVAC systems, the supply fans, the return fans. It's uh, lighting. You don't pick up too much kilowatts from lighting, typically turning off some lights in maybe a lobby or something like that. Uh, but you can pick up some. Turning off uh, maybe an elevator or two or a bank or two in, in your building. Plug loads, energy efficiency projects, on-site generation and BMS systems, the last two are without question uh, the best strategies for curtailing electrical load on a four-hour basis. So when you're talking about backup generation, you maybe you're a hospital and you've got one or two generators on the roof or out back. You can, that are diesel driven or natural gas uh, fuel generators. You turn on those generators. Instead of taking all, uh, load from the street, from the power grid, you're self-generating in essence. And uh, many, many organizations rely upon their backup emergency generators for demand response purposes. And then BMS systems. So many of our clients are very, very large office towers in New York City, some actually the biggest ones in, in the country. And you'd be surprised when you're looking at a 75-story building. Uh, on each floor, there are many, there are several air handling units. And, uh, and if the supply and return fan motors on those air handling units have variable frequency drives, BMS system is connected into that. All you have to do is slow down a motor about 10%. And when you multiply that, stack that up on all the floors of the building, you pick up tremendous amounts of demand. The beautiful thing about slowing down an electrical motor, as you might know, you're all engineers, or many of you are, is uh, uh, the, the associated demand drop is at the cubed rate, and it's, um, so it's, it's pretty substantial. And if, for instance, we were in this room, and the supply fans were slowed down by 10%, no one in this room would realize what's going on. You would not feel it. So it goes without saying, when an organization creates a demand response operations protocol, for each specific site, each specific building. You have to take in mind the mission of the facility. You cannot compromise the mission of the facility. We've worked with dozens of hospitals over the years. You know, there are things you can do in a hospital and there are things you cannot do in a hospital. And, and you learn what to recommend and what not to recommend. But by and large, as I say, these strategies really do apply across the board. So now let's talk about how it works and why it makes sense for a large organization to implement DR, even though you're a multi-site, multi-divisional, perhaps national or, or international organization. There's a lot of money involved. And the way it works is, as I said, the utility companies rely for that 12 to 18 to 16 hours for demand response each summer. Uh, what they'll do is they'll pay an organization like mine the demand response aggregator 
for curtailing load, KW demand when asked to do so. So what happens is, and this is not a new Energen rule, this is the way the industry works, is the utility companies uh, license organizations like ours to hire clients, to enroll those clients in these programs, the utility and the demand response programs, the utility company pays new Energen, and then we in turn pay the client. This, the industry standard is twice a year because there's usually two six month capability periods. And the client can make a lot of money. And the way the demand response aggregator is compensated is typically the demand response aggregator will retain a small percentage of that total program revenue. And the total program revenue for every 1,000 KW enrolled, one megawatt of load enrolled, can be as little, we see it as little as, worth as little as $10,000 per megawatt enrolled per year. It's an ongoing revenue stream. Organizations stay in, they, they keep enrolling year after year. To, uh, in New York City, that number is actually a bit dated. That number now is about $280,000 per 1,000 KW enrolled per year. It's a lot of money. We have clients who have dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, megawatts enrolled. And, um, and so without encountering too heavy a lift, if you're the client, again, you may be asked to curtail electrical load two to three to four times a summer for a four hour stint each time. The client gets paid very, very handsomely. The reason why this works for the utility company, why it makes sense, is it costs the utility companies and the ISOs a lot less money to pay a demand response aggregator and to pay all those thousands of buildings that curtail electrical load for a few hours when asked to do so. It costs them a lot less money than it would cost them if there was a blackout or a brownout. It's really that simple. And so that's why they do it. So there's a lot of financial incentive to participate in the program. All right, so here's the challenge. How do you get various stakeholders to understand and appreciate the value of demand response? And how do you encourage them uh, to, to grow their participation over time? And it's really about kind of, it's this process here that works that I'm gonna step you through right now. So let's talk about the city of New York. The city of New York, the largest municipal entity in the United States, they own over 4,000 buildings in the city, if you can believe it. When I first heard that number, I thought there's no way that's true. It is true. They, they, own, they own a lot of buildings. They spend about three quarters of a billion dollars a year on electricity. That's everything, for, everything that you would expect from a municipal organization, from sanitation to hospitals, transportation, bus depots, police, fire, wastewater treatment. They had been, going back five years ago, they had been on a very disparate basis and on an unstructured basis. They had some of their facilities enrolled in demand response. I think it was about 17 facilities. And some of you, I'm sure, have heard of Michael Bloomberg, the, <clears throat> the former mayor of New York City. About six years or so ago, he was uh, very much into renewable energy and understood the value of demand response. Uh, and, he, and he challenged his organization by saying, look, the city of New York is the largest landowner in the city of New York. And we have a whole bunch of facilities. We have a problem here in this city with our power grid because no one wants to build another power plant on the East River or on the Hudson River. It's not gonna happen in my lifetime again. But look at all the commercial development that's taken place over the last 30 years in the city of New York. So what you have is you have the demand for electricity continuing to grow, but the supply or the power generation to supply into that, that zone, it's called Zone J of the New York ISO, New York City, has not kept up with demand. And so Mayor Bloomberg said, I want to hire one demand response provider. I want a comprehensive program in place, cross agencies that make sense. You guys go do it. Go find a way to make it happen. And, uh, and they did. So they started out, though, very modestly. Uh, back, going back five years in the winter of 2013, you can see here they had six different agencies doing demand response. This is prior to hiring the company that ended up uh, doing this for them, New Energen. They only had 17 different buildings enrolled for a grand total of nine megawatts of load enrolled. Very, very modest. So um, they facilitated an RFP process. Everyone and their brother wanted to be chosen as the demand response provider. New Energen was fortunate enough to have been chosen. And uh, so what happens next? So you're faced with energy managers or procurement officers at a fairly senior level 
uh, within the, the, the government of the city of New York saying, all right, how do I do this? We've got 28 different agencies. How do we do this? So the way that it worked best for them, and I've seen this at other, for other clients, um, is we started with the energy managers. And um, you know, who basically knew very little about demand response. And, uh, and, the, and the, the building chief engineers, the facility chiefs, these are all busy folks who, when, someone, when a, a service provider or a contractor walks in the door, they think, oh boy, oh boy I'm gonna have more work to do, I don't wanna do this. You know, with all due respect to the government, you know, there's, there's, that mentality exists a lot with government employees. Um, and uh, so what you have to do is physically go to those facilities, look at their base building systems, the chiller plants, as I said earlier, the building management systems, the air handling systems, the backup generators, and, I, and collect the relevant uh, energy data for that facility. It's really very easy. It's not complicated. You get a utility account number, you pull down their, their historical utility uh, interval data, you build that picture, that load profile out over a year or two of what it looks like, what they peak out at, and then you walk into the building and look at those systems that consume energy and try to identify using those six or seven strategies that I, I showed you a few slides ago, try to identify what can be done in that building without compromising the inhabitants of the building. So you don't want to put anyone in the dark, you don't want to make anyone hot, um, and, and so on and so forth. And so um, about 400 or so on-site uh, visits uh, were performed. We call this doing a demand response uh, operations protocol site visit. And, um, uh, and then, uh, and, and by the way, that's done specific, as I mentioned, to each site because it needs to be done by site. And then what you end up doing is educating the facilities engineers along the way. They understand this is not the end of the world for them. This is not gonna make anyone mad at them if they participate in the program. And so you kind of build that support uh, by just doing some analysis and saying to them, hey, here's what you can do in your building. We think there's 200 kW of load. Here's the math that, that, uh, that, that proves that out. And uh, we think you ought to support this because it's part of a larger uh, initiative on behalf of your employer. And, uh, and you build support over time if you do that. Now, documenting. Uh, I think it's really important for any large organization to have a, a portal, some kind of um, web-based security, 24-7 web access portal where the individual site managers, building engineers, chief engineers, and people at the senior level can go into and say, all right, of all of these buildings that I have enrolled in demand response, what are my commitments? What are my demand response protocols? Uh, for each building, and this is kind of a screenshot that shows some of that. It shows, uh, in this case, this is the City University of New York, this agency. These are specific resources or locations or campuses. The utility account number, the program that they're in, that's the New York ISO Special Case Resource Program, the dates, the enrollment amounts, the targets, and then over here, information such as protocols as kept, past performance reports, after every demand response event, the data is collected to see if you met your target. So that data is all there, it's readily accessible, um, and it makes the client, the people who, who you touch through demand response, the people who are enrolled in these programs, much more comfortable if they have access to this data. And, and, and their commitment to the program ends up building over time. In this case, the client themselves created a document, a program overview document of what demand response is. Um, it's really important whether you're dealing with the United States Navy, the General Services Administration, or the City of New York, uh, any kind of large organization you have to have, within the client organization, you have to have one or two internal champions. You know, central focal points who are kind of the go-to for their brethren uh, across various agencies for questions and, and for support. And so in this case, um, they, had a, they, they have a, a central procurement organization called DCAS, Department of Central Administration Services. It's basically the contracting arm of the city of New York. They have an energy division within uh, that department and they had a couple people on point who were the direct contacts for uh, the other agencies within the city who were uh, enrolled in, in DR. And this is just a simple document that they put together that they shared with their counterparts. Um, 
there are three programs in this case in the city of New York that they are enrolled in. It's really important to educate clients. Again, the biggest thing that, um, the biggest, one of the biggest hurdles initially is this mindset or, uh, or bias, if you will, that, uh, oh no, if I do this demand response thing, um, people are gonna be mad at me because I'm gonna make it really uncomfortable for a few hours on a hot day and I'm gonna have people yelling at me and, and, uh, and I don't wanna do that. Once they realize that very much is not the case, then attitudes change. Um, and so it's, it's important just to give them a very brief overview of how this, of the various programs they're in, some of the parameters around those programs, um, uh, the, the successful organizations who have implemented demand response have forums, usually semi-annually or annually, where all the people who are involved are invited. Um, we'd, uh, we did this a couple weeks ago, actually, with the city of New York, and they had several hundred people at this event to answer questions, to provide updated information, so everyone is comfortable with what's going on. So let's talk about dispatch. I mentioned to you earlier that um, the way demand response works is the, the utility or the ISO will contact the aggregator. In some cases, it's a full day in advance of a demand response call, event call. Sometimes it's only two or three hours in advance. They'll contact the aggregator, the demand response ag ag aggregator then dispatches the client. So if you have a, a large organization that has hundreds of sites enrolled in DR, you have to be able to get to them very quickly. Because the bottom line is this, I had mentioned to you earlier about the value of being enrolled in DR, the financial benefits of the client, uh, but there's a little hook to all of that. And that is that when a demand response event happens, you gotta curtail. If you don't curtail, you're not paid. And so the challenge here is to make sure that the client in fact knows there will be an event, for example, a demand response event tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m. It will be four hours long. And oh, by the way, here are the specific things that you need to do in your building. And uh, so that they perform because they're paid a lot more for performance. And that's what this is showing. This is showing an email that goes out. The client can acknowledge receipt of that email. It goes back to a network operations center so the aggregator knows, all right, this hospital or this wastewater treatment facility or this office building knows what they need to do. They don't have any questions. Um, these are the operations parameters for that specific site that's being contacted. Those dispatches go out via email. Most aggregators will do it via email. This can go to thousands of people, by the way. And when you have hundreds of buildings enrolled, a few people at each building who need to be notified, it, it will go to thousands of people. So again, specific for their facility. If they don't acknowledge that, uh, text messages can be sent. It's all automated. Uh, at our company, we actually send the email and the text messages side by side. And the client can acknowledge uh, using either platform. And, uh, and then if there's no acknowledgement, then the good old fashioned phone calls start from the team. Again, they want to make sure that they understand there will be an event, answer any questions they have, and so that they're good to go for that four hour time frame. This, is, this shows what that DCAS organization I, I mentioned to you, which is that arm of the city of New York, of the purchasing arm of the city of New York. They send something like this out uh, the day of the demand response events. Again, this is on top of what the aggregator does. Again, they're just trying to do their part and making sure that their colleagues understand what's going on. All right, so here's a very important thing. Um, what, you, what you really want to avoid is getting a facility enrolled in demand response and in the first summer, they end up not performing because someone didn't know or the right people didn't know there was an event. Because in that case, as I mentioned just a moment ago, they won't get paid any money. They don't get paid any money for being in the program. They get disillusioned. They decide, ah, why am I doing this? I don't want to be in. And uh, so um, what our organization does, and many we've seen others do the same, is we kind of identify what we call primaries and secondaries within each organization. A primary person is someone who can actually turn something on or off in the building. A secondary person is someone who should know there's a demand response event that's going to take place that afternoon. But he or she cannot turn anything on or off. No offense to the secondaries, but they don't matter. What matters, and we tell them this, too, respectfully. What matters is the, are the primaries, the women and men who can actually turn something on or off in a building. And so, um, so you really want to make sure that, there, that you get acknowledgments uh, prior to a demand response event from your primaries. 
Secondary is great to know, but if there are no primaries acknowledging, then we know we have an issue. We gotta get on the phone and get to the right people there. Um, so this is a bit redundant. This is showing kind of a, a notification that goes out. Um, one thing that's a very useful tool uh, is to give that feedback in real time of performance back to the facility. And the way that can be done is, ver is very easily uh, accomplished. Right here you have the utility meter. It's an, interval, an hourly interval meter. Most utility companies require that a demarcation box is wired to the utility meter because they don't want third parties like my company or others wiring into a utility meter, no one touches that, but what you can do is you can take a pulse output from the demarcation box by putting a real-time meter in on the building. Now, this is not sub-metering the buildings. This is just one real-time meter on the utility meter, which shows in five-minute increments, and it's effectively in real time, if that client is meeting their target KW during an event. The reason why that's really important here is that, and we see this all the time, you've got a hospital engineer who knows there's an event, that hospital engineer has enacted her operations procedures for demand response, and, the, and, that, and that operations uh, person is looking in real time uh, at their demand response portal and can see that, may, that may, she might be 100 kW, for example, short of where she needs to be. From a, from a target KW standpoint, from a curtailment standpoint. If you could see that in real time, and it happens all the time, they will do more in their building to get to the target. It's just human nature. They want to perform. So it's a very, very effective feedback mechanism uh, that, that translates into better performance to your target KW, which translates into more monetary reward to the client. And it just kind of builds. Uh, I can only speak for the aggregated portfolio for new energy, and I can't speak for others, but I can tell you very candidly, um, we have thousands of facilities enrolled in demand response, principally in the Northeast, and uh, of the, if, I, if I were to look at the aggregated enrollment for those facilities that have real-time meters and those that don't, the, the, the facilities that have real-time meters outperform those who don't have real-time meters in our case, by about 28%. It's a pretty big number. Because if you don't have that real-time meter on the utility meter, and if the facilities engineer cannot see in real time whether or not she or he are getting to their target, they're basically flying blind. They, they are during a demand response event. They did the four, five, or six things that, that we asked them to do, but they really do not know if they're at that target KW. They hope they are. And so, um, and so that's really a, a, an effective, uh, thing to do. Again, in the portal that they have access to, we put performance reports in there and, uh, and provide them, again, the real-time data necessary uh, for them to know whether or not they're performing or not. Here's something that's really important. You get through all this process, more, fo more locations are being enrolled, more agencies are, are raising their hands saying, I want in, I want to participate. It's really important to show and to recognize those people who are succeeding and who are participating. Uh, the way we've done this with them, this is a picture of uh, this, this woman reports to the mayor of the city of New York. Uh, this was a couple years ago, and this was, you know, a, you know, it's like Publishers Clearinghouse. I know it's kind of hokey, but they love it. You know, present them with their, in this case, a five and a half million dollar uh, check for, for their summer's participation. That's two years ago, two weeks ago, I presented the same check to the city of New York. It was $10.2 million for one summer of participation. And that was for the summer of 17. We gave them the check a couple of weeks ago. And um, they had to curtail a grand total of just a few hours for the whole summer. That's it. And they earned that. And they're being good neighbors. They're helping to avoid a blackout or a brownout. And, uh, and everyone feels good about it. You stand up there. Um, these folks are uh, you know, various engineers, facilities managers. We give them certificates of appreciation uh, for their participation in the program. They have an award ceremony. It's the city of New York does this. And, and everyone's involved. It's in, next year they want to do it in Carnegie Hall. This past uh, couple weeks ago, it was in a, mu in a museum that the city of New York owns and in, a very, in a lovely auditorium. And they make a big deal about it. It's like a party. 
And, um, and we find that, that um, taking that effort to recognize the chief engineer, the facilities manager, who frankly never gets recognized for anything. They're all busy and, they're, and their jobs are, you know, they come in every day and they have headaches. Um, yeah, it, it really goes uh, a long way with them. And, uh, and, it's, and it's worth doing. So where are we today? We started, I, I started by saying that five years ago, the city of New York had 17 buildings enrolled for a grand total of nine megawatts of enrollment. Today, they have over 400. It's actually about 460, as I speak to you right now. And um, I apologize, this is a bit dated. We just made a, a lot of progress in the last few weeks with them. That 75 megawatt number was accurate for 2017. For 2018, this summer upcoming, they're enrolled for 97 megawatts. When they, when they began this initiative, Mike, Mayor Michael Bloomberg said, I have nine megawatts enrolled. I want to hire someone who's going to get us to 50 megawatts in five years. They got to 50 megawatts in three years. Now they're in their fifth year, and they're at 97 megawatts. It's really a phenomenal story. And it's about 26 or uh, 25 or 26 different agencies of the city government are enrolled. Uh, I've got members of my team who support the city of New York, who constantly get calls from other agencies, other folks saying, hey, I want in. I heard about what's going on here. And, um, and another company could have done the same thing that New Energen did. It's not that we're the greatest folks in the world. We're very proud of what we've achieved with the city of New York. Uh, but. Um, it's really obvious to me when I see that it really was just about rolling up your sleeves, visiting the site people, helping them to understand DR isn't going to get them fired, help them to earn a few bucks, get them recognized for it, and then it just builds like a snowball rolling down a hill. And here we are five years later, 450, 460 facilities enrolled for 97 megawatts at 250 plus thousand dollars per megawatt per megawatt year enrolled and uh, it's a phenomenal story um, they're being recognized uh, this is uh, some of the people who are key to the city of New York last year they're recognized by the peak load management association which is a nationally recognized um, organization when it comes to demand response uh, and the folks from PLMA said, stood up and said, look, we've never seen a government entity, a large entity, especially something with someone like the city of New York do this before. It's phenomenal what you've accomplished. So I personally have had the benefit of seeing the United States General Services Administration do something similar. And we've seen the United States Navy do something similar. But really the key, uh, in my opinion, the key X factor here was building the program from the ground up versus the mayor or the governor or a regional administrator of the GSA simply saying, hey guys, we need to do DR, it's the right thing to do. You all do it, go make it happen. Um, when those dictums come down on a high, the people at the field level, they get, they get those kind of memorandum all the, memoranda all the time. And sometimes they follow up on it, sometimes they don't. More often than not, they don't. But in this case, because the site-by-site -site field operators were engaged with their demand response operator, and they, because they became very comfortable with the program, that's how they, that's a, the, it was built from the bottom up. And, and that's why we have the success story today that we have. So key takeaways, really, it's no, no organization is too complex. It's, 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 it's not rocket science here. If you align the incentives, financial and otherwise, uh, it works, communication up and down across the organization, um, provide meaningful information, not Greek, not Latin, just the simple, basic information to laymen, to laypersons, so they understand what they need to do, and that uh, it's, it's not going to get them in trouble. And then uh, celebrate your successes. You know, have those, have those big parties, present them with the big check, and, and congratulate them on their successes. So what's interesting is the city of New York has accomplished this over the last few years. And now what we're seeing is the city of Chicago, the city of Philadelphia, and some others um, uh, say, hey, how, how'd you do this? We want to do this. We know it's necessary. And when you think about demand response, it's really 
necessary, as I said earlier, just in the, you know, it's bicoastal in Texas, in the upper Midwest. It's in the population centers of the United States where, particularly today, um, with the deployment of more distributed power generation, as we all know, power, you know states, regions want more renewable energy. Uh, they, they, and what they're doing is, is, uh, is uh, photovoltaic arrays, battery storage systems, windmills, whatever the case may be, um, they're, they're trying to get away from highly, the model from that started in the beginning of the last century of the highly centralized power generation model to a more distributed energy resource model. The problem with that is when you're relying, and I'm, please don't misunderstand me, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting that deploying distributed energy resources, microgrids and things of that kind is a bad thing, it's a very good thing. But, but they're not as reliable. It gets, it gets, it rains, it gets cloudy, the PV array isn't generating, or something else happens. And those sources of power generation are not as reliable as, for example, the nuclear power plant that no one wants to build today, that can run 24-7, 365 at infinitum. And so what that does is with the deployment of renewable energy and distributed energy power generation across the power grid in the United States, particularly by coastally, uh, what that does is that creates more variability in power generation. That's what I'm trying to get at. And because, but you're still gonna have that third 95 plus degree day in July or August, irrespective of whether or not your generation of energy is variable or not. And so what that's done is it's increased the demand for demand response. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna see more and more organizations embrace it, uh, either through regulatory statute or uh, just because people realize they need to do it because, again, uh, no one wants to bid, build another big power plant in their backyard, not in the population centers. Here in Nevada, you can, you can put a big power plant out in the desert. It's not a problem. Can't do it in New York. Can't do it in Chicago, not easily anyway. And, not, and even, in, even in Texas, they're having issues now where they, do, they no longer want to build very, very large power plants. They want to go to a more distributed model, which is kind of interesting, certainly in California, as, as you all may know. No one wants to build a power plant out there, regardless of where you are. And um, so, uh, so we're going to see the need for demand response to continue to increase so my message to you is you speak to your prospective clients or developers, whomever it might be, is that no organization is too big to, to start, no organization is too complex, and, and there's some really very, very terrific success stories out there that make it worth everyone's while. And that's it, folks. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Sure. Yeah, that's a very good question. They're saving energy and they really don't notice it. Mm -hmm. In the course of the day, you could right. trim it to 90% at that hot part of the day. Yeah. So, so here's the thing. Most organizations, if they're progressive on the energy front, if they're sophisticated, they are effectively optimizing their peak load, which is what you're talking about, via BMS systems, via protocols. They are doing that. But our experience is, again, for those two, three, four days of the year, uh, when the power grid needs assistance, there's more that you can do in the building. So for instance, turning on that backup generator, you're not doing that every day. Yeah, you can do that. Slowing down those fan systems a little bit more, you can do that. You don't wanna do that for, for 12 hours uh, on peak. You can do it for three or four hours though. And so there are incremental marginal things strategies that you can employ for just a handful of events during the year, and when you add those things up, it, 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 uh, it turns into a meaningful number. Yes, sir? So, uh, as I understood it at the beginning, the funding comes from utilities. That's correct. To organizations like yourself. So first we have to find out where, where if, if that, before we go to the clients, if there has got to be a utility district that they, they already have public price that, that's available. Like, that's true. So, so, you just have to identify whether or not the program exists. So, are you familiar with the ISOs around the United States? Not really. 
Okay, so, um, so it's not difficult to find out uh, and uh, whether or not a demand response program exists. And the way to think of it is to think of it in these terms. The rate payer, your client, they're actually paying, paying for this already. They're paying for it in, their, in what's called their demand charges or their capacity charges. And so the utility company, via uh, approval by the Public Services Commission or the Public Utilities Commission on a state-by-state -state basis, the utility company has baked in their tariff collecting certain demand charges. They're pulling from those demand charges, the utility, from that pool of demand charges to pay me and then for me to then pay my client. And uh, so you know, if you sit across from a, a large organization who's not participating in demand response, it's not a stretch to say, you know, you're already paying for this, but you're not receiving the financial benefit. Because they are, it's in their rate right now. That's, and that's why the utility companies are com comfortable with it. They're also uh, very, the ones who are doing it are also very committed to demand response because they know that, uh, that the cost of those demand charges that they're compensating clients for is far, far less than the headaches they will encounter financial and otherwise associated with a blackout. Yeah, yeah. Is that, is that you guys? Yeah, we do it. And other aggregators do it. So we have engineers who will go into the building who really know we're very good at this. This is not a very engineering intensive analysis. There is a lot of this involved. And, but, uh, but you do the math, you get the horsepowers, and you understand what you can and can't do. Now, what you typically do, the prudent way to proceed with the client, is to do that back of the envelope analysis, so to speak. It's a little bit more than back of an envelope, but to, to do that, that analysis, and let's say you think they can curtail 500 kW. You go to the client and you say, you know what, this summer, let's enroll you for 400 kW. Now we think we can do 500, but let's, let's, let's walk, let's no, crawl before we walk, walk before we run, because again, um, a client who curtails 100% of a 400 kW enrollment will earn more money than a client who performs 80% of a 500 kW enrollment. Now I know you might say, well, wait a minute, the math doesn't work there. 80% of 500 is 400, 100% of 400 is 400. Shouldn't that be paid the same? I delivered 400 to the grid. The answer is no. The power grid takes the position, the, the utility company takes the position of, look, if you're gonna enroll for 400 kW, you're telling me you'll, you'll give me 400 kW off the grid if I ask you to give it to me. I'm gonna pay you more than if you, I'm gonna pay you a lot more than if you curtailed a smaller, a less than 100% percentage of a larger enrollment. They're, exactly, they are depending on it. This is an insurance program for the power grid. So all this is, is an insurance, a grid reliability insurance program. So they're gonna pay you more. Now if you underperform, it varies around the United States. But if the client underperforms in a demand response event, some of the utilities will derate that client. So you get, you get basically a, pen, a, a penalty factor that, that carries forward for a period of time, in some cases as far as 18 months, in most cases 12 months, which means let's say your 500 kW was enrolled, you only curtail 250. So you performed at 50% of your target. There are some utilities in the United States who will say, okay, you want to enroll for you can, you can uh, enroll for 500 kW next summer, the following summer, but we're only gonna pay you on 250 kW because you're derated 50%. Until such time as you can prove to me that you in fact can do 500. So the point here is you wanna be prudent. You, you, start, you start modestly, you do your analysis, you think you can, you can uh, curtail 500, you enroll them for 400. So what happens is, they, they do 120% or 110% during a demand response event, and then they get, the, they get their payment, they get their check, and guess what happens? The building engineer, the chief engineer is coming to us and saying, hey, why can't we do five, 550, forget 500. Let's do 550, let's try 600. I think I can do it, I've got some other ideas. And uh, so that, that's kind of the dynamic in play. Yes, ma'am. Um, I actually work for 
the city of New York. I, oh. I don't work for DCAS, but I do work in a building that's managed by DCAS. May I ask what, which agency? Department of Buildings. Uh, oh, excellent. So I can attest to, um, they do let us know when there's a demand response event happening, um, and it isn't an inconvenience to us. Um, it is or is not? It isn't. Yeah. And I, you answered my question because you said it, it's an insurance policy, but I was going to ask you if, if um, you actually you know, would consider it a conservation measure or oh, by all means. energy. Yeah. So when I say it's an insurance policy, I, I'm commenting from the standpoint of grid reliability or resiliency. It is an environmentally sustainable initiative, too. I'll tell you why. It's a sustainability program. It's green. DR is green. Because it allows the region, in this case, it allows the city of New York not to have to build that next power plant on the East River that no one wants. That would not be green. For that simple reason. Because I, I used to work for Merck Pharmaceuticals in New Jersey, and we did demand response. And mm -hmm. on most of these demand response events, what we were basically doing is switching from our electric chillers to our natural, natural gas chillers. Yeah. And I just always sort of struggled with that. Like, I know. You know it's because there's really emissions. Conservation, you know. Yeah, I know. There are emissions associated with running uh, a natural gas uh, fueled backup generator or a diesel fueled backup generator. But there's another way of looking at it. Thank you so much for letting me know that you're with DOB. That's great. Um, and congratulations on what the city has achieved. It's really phenomenal. Were you, by the way, were you familiar with those numbers? Yeah, it's a, it's a phenomenal achievement. Um, so, um, so the way that I have heard regulators refer to this in terms of being sustainable is, okay, in the city of New York, you're gonna turn on a bunch of diesel engines. They're dirty. Some are dirtier than others, by the way. And, and you can't use really dirty old engines. You have to use relatively clean engines for DR uh, in New York City, in New York State as well. Um, but uh, and I think this is a, is a legitimate point. I've heard regulators say, wait a second, okay, we may turn on a couple of hundred or 400 backup generators in the city of New York for a four hour period of time to avoid a blackout. What happens if there's a blackout? How many engines do you think are gonna be on then? 10X, that? 10X, sir. I'm sorry? Indeed, yeah. Yeah, there's really cool stuff going on too where, uh, and the city of New York is looking at this as well, I'm sure you're aware is, and, and in the private sector in New York City is using battery storage systems for demand response. It's pretty cool. And uh, you know, they just have to hold the charge for, for four hours and you can roll that load in DR and you charge that battery uh, off hours, off peak. So it's a pretty, the economics of it uh, make good sense. What's really interesting is when you, when you connect a battery storage system to a PV array, a photovoltaic array, which is going on now too. People are starting to look at that. And so you've got the PV array generating you know, very green energy. It's charging the battery. You might drain that battery on peak every day or have it, and in addition to that, have it available for a DR event. It's a pretty cool solution. Sir? You have to wait another two or three years because the price of batteries. It's very high. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, the economics have not been uh, attractive in the private sector. It's much improved. It has, it has a ways to go. I, I agree with you. Uh, but we're seeing the, the, what I just described to you with PV arrays and battery storage systems, we're principally seeing federal agencies doing that because with all due respect to the federal government, of course, um, you know, they're doing this for more than economic reasons. So the economics aren't terribly attractive, but they're doing it for other reasons. Indeed, and, and all of those microgrid projects, I don't know if any of you sat in earlier and listened to the gentleman from Schneider Electric about microgrids. It's really terrific. There's a nice, uh, you know, there's a nice DR, op demand response opportunity associated with those microgrids. 
they can they can generate that revenue stream. Um, yeah, in addition to the other benefits of having a microgrid, the resiliency benefits. Anyone else? Yeah, I guess I have a question here. Sir, oh, I guess, sorry. I guess, yeah, on, on average, what, what percent peak uh, reduction are you guys achieving on, on billing? Yeah, it's a very good question. I wish I knew the answer. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think I know the answer, but um, I think the average is about 12%, I think. Uh, but I'm not confident of that, but it's in that range, that 10 to 15% range. Okay. Now, the outliers are where you can go full island. It's called going full island. So for instance, the wastewater treatment facilities, as, as you might expect, the Department of Environmental Protection, you know, they have full backup, 100% power generation backup capability, as you would expect for a large wastewater treatment facility. They have to be able to do what they do, even if the power goes out. So in that case, you get 100% drop. They go to zero. They literally go to zero. But I think the average is about 12%. Okay. You bet. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Oh, there is? Oh, you're asking me if there is? Huh. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it, I'm sorry. But I love the idea. Anyone else? Well, thanks a bunch for your time, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of, rest of the day. Thank you.